What's going on drivers? Welcome to Trucking with Old Snapper. If you're new to the channel, please smash that like and subscribe button. Doesn't cost a thing. But anyway, today we're going to talk about comparing shrimping, commercial shrimping, to trucking. And I know some of you right now are probably like, what? There is no comparison. And in many ways, there's not. The work is, the work for sure there is no comparison. But there is something that there is in common there is something that there was in common between the two and shrimping in my time growing up in that era my family owned shrimp boats growing up on the texas coast sometimes i worked in the refinery sometimes i worked on their boats sometimes they had other people run the boats but i always worked on the boats anytime we were down there i worked on the boats started working on them when i was about six years old and uh, the last year i shrimped was I want to say 98 or 99 would have been my last year on the boat. But I remember as a teenager, my stepfather telling me, he said, uh, you're going to want to find something else to do in life because this will not be here in another 20 years. And I was like, what? I thought he was just paranoid being a conspiracy theorist, but he was right. He died before it came to pass, but he was correct. He saw something coming that I didn't see as, as a teenager, I, I didn't recognize it. And also, he was one of the few that said shrimping was going away, and there were a lot of people that lived in that lifestyle that were just like truckers, said, nah, that's never gonna happen. That's not possible, all right? Well, it was possible, and it did happen. And here's what they did, and you're gonna see some similarities here. The U.S. government started bringing in Vietnamese and, uh, Orientals, Asians, some Hispanics from Mexico. They had programs in place to help them get boats and help them get their licenses and stuff like that. They also gave them a tax exemption for X amount of years, and I don't remember what it was. That was the first step. The second thing they did was they come in and started implementing laws. They said, okay, well, the shrimpers are killing off too many of the fish, so we need to put fish shooters in. All right, the shrimpers are killing off too many of the turtles. So we need to put turtle shooters in. And these are devices that were implemented into the nets in order to help these creatures escape so they didn't die. Here's the trippy part about turtles. Been on a boat since the 80s. I never once saw a turtle. And, and now we fished in the bays. We did fish the gulf, but mostly in the bays, in the bay system. I never saw a turtle until they came down there and released turtles. When, when they came to the beach and they did a big release down there, I was probably about maybe nine or 10 years old. That was the first time in my life I had ever seen a turtle in the, in the ocean, in, in the bay, okay? We didn't have them. They had them offshore. They had them in the Gulf, but we didn't have them in the bay system. We weren't a danger to them because they didn't exist in the bay system. And even after they released them, they still really didn't exist in the bay system because over time, they worked their way out to the Gulf of Mexico, and that's that's their habitat. They like that saltier water. So they still weren't really uh, a problem. But the government needed to do something. And here's the thing. In my personal opinion, I believe the government was protecting the petro and chemical refineries. If you look in the state of Texas, especially along the coast, we got a lot of petrochemical refineries. Exxon Mobil, Dow Chemical, Valero, Air Liquide, uh, BP Chemicals multiple refineries up and down the coast, Formosa Plastics, you name it. They all have excess waste that they have to dump. Now, the waste that they dump, they claim is clean. It's been, you know, safe for the environment and yada, yada, yada. You know, and it's, it's supposedly tested. But you got to remember, too, money talks. In our country, money talks. And these petrochemical refineries kick a lot of money back to lobbyists back to state government and federal government so there's a lot of cover-ups in the in the process they knew that it had an impact on the environment and this now mind you this is all my opinion there are some documentaries out there but this right here is just based on my opinion from what i saw with my own eyes they knew they had an impact on the environment but they couldn't accept responsibility for it because if the government acknowledged that the petrochemical refineries were in fact impacting the environment well that would have caused them to have to cut back or close 
they could they couldn't have that with the amount of money that's going back to lobbyists and the and the government officials going in their pockets. So what did they do? They shift the blame. They shifted the blame to blame the commercial fishing industry, shrimpers, crabbers, those type of people. And it had a double benefit effect because in in that line of work you could disappear. There were a ton of people like. Most people that were in that line of work were either on drugs or wanted by the law. They were hiding from something or hiding from someone. Because you could literally go into that industry and make a pretty good living. It was a decent living back in those days. You know, um, I remember now as a deckhand, you know, a deckhand could do two, $3,000 a week sometimes. And this was back in the 80s and 90s. It was really good money, especially for someone who was basically off the grid you could go into that line of work and just disappear the government couldn't track you it was hard to track your money it was hard to even track the money that the boats were making now whatever the boats sold to the commercial fishing you know whatever they sold to the fish houses that money was easy to track and easy to tax so the government could, could get their tax money but a lot of shrimp crabs fish were sold hand to hand you know you would come in you would sell so much to the fish house and you already had buyers set up, so you'd go park your boat. They would come down with their ice chest and cash money. You would sell sell shrimp, fish, crabs, or whatever to them. And it, the government couldn't track that. And I think that was the other benefit to getting rid of shrimpers. You know, they there was less money for them to steal from tax dollars and put in their pocket. They also needed to protect the petrochemical refineries. Now, commercial shrimping and fishing still exist in texas but it's a very 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 small amount very small amount like uh the last time i looked was a few years ago in commercial shrimping licenses there was like less than 250 i think less than 250 of them on the entire gulf coast that's from brownsville all the way up to the louisiana line that's a lot of coastline we probably had that many in just the county i live in back in the 80s and 90s that's how much it's cut back and the, ma and the vast majority of those licenses belong to foreign people very few of them probably less than 10 percent of them are american owned boats that are still operating in texas and the way the government pushed it out was implementing laws because when they when they brought in the turtle shooters which i'm gonna play a clip right here i'm gonna mute it but i'm gonna play it this is from a protest that was done in 1989 in a Ranzas pass texas and everyone was uh protesting the turtle shooters M me and my family were not involved in it some of my uncles were but we were in california working a construction job at the time so we were not involved in this actual protest but they blocked the shipping lanes i'm gonna let it play in the background while i talk about this they, they implemented laws like the turtle shooter. They knew we would lose some of our shrimp along with it. Shrimp are going out that hole just like turtles are. So they knew that would lower the profit that the boat made. The fish shooters, the same thing. They knew that some of our shrimp would go out that hole that would lower the profit that the boat was making, making it harder for the boat to operate. You know, so they implemented things like that. Then they came in and said, okay, well, we're killing off too many shrimp, so we're going to implement a... Uh, a limit you know just like in trucking how we have so many hours a day we can work well in shrimping what they did is they came in and implemented a limit so during browning sh browning shrimp season or brown shrimp season whichever way you want to call it during that time was like uh, i think it was july the 15th to august the 15th was when that species of shrimp was being caught you could only catch 200 pounds that was your daily limit was 200 pounds that's it now, I'm going to tell you right now, you're trying to pay for fuel, nets, you're trying to pay for repairs, you're trying to pay a deck in, food, drinks, 200 pounds a day, you're cutting it pretty close to barely making anything. That was the first thing they did. The next thing they did is they came in and said, all right, well, in fall season, white shrimp season, which is August 15th, runs for a couple of months. And uh, they came in and said 600 pound limit on fall shrimp season. Big net season is what we called it. Because during uh, fall season, you could, you could pull a 65 foot net. Whereas in uh, brown shrimp season, you could only pull a 32 foot net with a lower limit. So that's what they did. 
So that cut the profit down on that some more. Then they came down real hard with the game board and started enforcing a lot of different laws and basically just pushed it out. They also came in and said, okay, we're not going to allow any more new shrimpers to come into the industry. So like myself right now, let's say I decided I wanted to go back and I wanted to become a shrimper and, and go back into the lifestyle that I grew up in. I can't. I can't do it. The state doesn't sell new shrimping licenses anymore. You cannot go start a business as a shrimper anymore in the state of Texas. The only way you can do it is if you have an existing license. They will not issue any new licenses. They also have a buyback program. Because you can go down and you can buy someone else's license from them. But the state of Texas has a buyback program. So they'll buy that license back from them too. And then they just discard it. They never sell it again. That's why the shrimping population went down. I can go I can go home and I can buy a license off somebody, but they're only going to sell me that license for more than what the state's offering them to buy that license from them. You see what I'm saying? So it took that it took that profitability away. That guy's not going to sell me that license for less than what the state's going to give him. The state's already going to offer him more money than what the license is worth. So it's really hard to get a license. Hardly anybody's going to sell you one because if they're selling their license they're going to sell it back to the state. Now, you might be asking, what in the hell does this have to do with trucking? We are 12 minutes into this video, and I'm not understanding what this has got to do with trucking. All right, now, it's a little bit different scenario, because as truckers, we are tracked. Our money is taxed. It's very easy for them to figure out, even as an owner-operator, to figure out what, uh, what taxes we owe and all that kind of stuff. We also can't disappear off the grid. We're tracked very easily between our commercial licenses and the the ELDs that we have on our trucks. But, but, here's where the kicker comes in. I hear a lot of drivers saying, oh man, automated trucks are never going to take over the industry. They're never going to put us out of our jobs. They're always going to need us. They need food on the table. They need these things hauled. Yada, yada, yada. And you're correct. And here's the similarity. I remember shrimpers back in the day saying the same same thing or similar things whenever shrimping was being put out and a lot of the guys were like, that's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Well, it did. It dang sure did happen. I lived through it. It happened in my lifetime. All right. I watched it happen. And a lot of those same guys that didn't think it was going to happen. They're working in grocery stores now, or they're working fast food or they're drawing an SSI check, you know, and they didn't believe it was coming either. And they weren't prepared for it. And it came and it did. If the government decides they're going to do something, they're going to do it. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's the way it is. Now, do I think that automated trucks, driverless trucks are going to be industry-wide and take over everything? No. There's a lot of situations that they're not going to work in. But I think it's going to be a combination of two things. Because they claim there's a driver shortage. So since they claim there's a driver shortage, they can expedite work visas, bringing people into the country and putting them in a truck. Putting them through school and putting them in a truck. They have programs for that. A lot of these mega carriers, some of these mega carriers are involved in that, you know, and helping people come over from other countries and go through a school and get in and get into a truck. That's one thing. The other part is the uh, automated trucks. I think we're going to have a combination of both. I, and I honestly believe that in the coming years, you're going to see less and less Americans out here. You're going to see foreign drivers and automated trucks are the two things you're going to see. They're willing to work for less. They're willing to work harder and do more than the American is. So they're going to take over the spots where an automated truck won't work. And then where the automated truck does work, you're going to have automated trucks there. I think you're going to see a change in the industry. And I may be wrong, and I hope I am. But I honestly feel like that is the direction it's going. And especially having been what I've been through in my younger years in Texas and seeing what the government did there, it's very possible. I wouldn't put anything past them. What's your thoughts? What do you think? Do you think they're trying to push Americans out of the industry? Do you think they're trying to push Americans out of trucks? Do you think it's going to go more in, in the direction of foreign drivers and um, automated trucks pretty much industry-wide? What are your thoughts on it? And if you do think that, how long do you think it's going to take for them to achieve that? I can tell you in my 13 years out here, 14 years out here, they've they've achieved quite a bit. They've gone a long way. The industry's changed a lot since what it was whenever I first started. 
you know, so they've done it pretty, pretty fast. And it seems like as time goes by, it gets faster and faster. But what are your thoughts on this situation? Do you think it's possible? Do you think they're trying to push us out of the industry? You think, do you think they want owner operators? They want American drivers out of the industry? Do you think that's the situation? Drop down in the comments and let me know below. I appreciate all of y'all for stopping by. Y'all take care, stay safe. Remember to be good to one another. And like I always say, let's keep trucking.